Now, ladies and gentlemen, I might have your attention. Uh, we'll start the afternoon session. Okay. Um, so our first speaker this afternoon is uh, Matty Duan. Uh, Matty's Procurement Director of Specialist Project Services Limited. For the past number of years, he's worked extensively as a procurement specialist with Alexian Pharmaceuticals. He's an expert in the procurement of capital equipment, procurement with significant experience in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology sectors of the economy. Uh, his specialities include strategic procurement, category management, negotiated procurement savings and dispute resolution. Uh, Matty is a member of the leadership group of Lean Construction Ireland and has been influential in moving the organisation forward in recent times. Uh, Matty has focused on the need to engender lean construction concepts into construction contracts. So today Matty will explain some of the work of uh, LCI, Lean Construction Ireland, and then focus on the main uh, LCI initiative uh, which is lean in contracts. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Martin, thank you for that. And uh, thanks for inviting me on behalf of LCI to uh, come here today. Um, I suppose I want to uh, speak, first of all, briefly to introduce you all to Lean Construction Ireland and then speak a little bit about one of our key initiatives, which is Lean in Contracts. Um, I suppose the first lean thing I want to do is be brief and try and get this schedule back on track. So that's the, the first thing we do. So technology is the next challenge. Okay. So um, as I said, that's just an overview of the slides. Um, so Lean Construction Ireland, an introduction, uh, who we are and what we do. So Lean Construction Ireland was established in March 2014, so it's uh, just four years old now. Um, was established primarily with, from interested groups in the IT and the pharma industry and sectors and uh, has grown from there. Uh, the key objective of LCI has been promoting the adoption of lean thinking and practices to the Irish construction sector. We've done this through community events, monthly webinars, our LCI website, publishing articles, and growing our leadership group, which is the group of, of participating companies and bodies and, uh, and organizations, so to, to more than 40 organizations at this stage. Um, to date, LCI have hosted uh, 13 uh, community events, uh, Cumulative attendance there is over 2,000 attendees. Uh, we've presented 15 online webinars, which are available on website. Um, there's been over 500 people connecting in through those, and a lot of people then sharing and downloading them uh, in addition to that. We've facilitated regional and local lean breakfast sessions and other educational section sessions, and we've further redeveloped our website. Um, tr so through all these communications then, We've seen the Irish construction sector start to recognize the value of adopting lean, lean thinking and practices, and as a result, the sector is looking to understand more about lean and how they can implement it and implement that as part of their business processes and project delivery. So in response to the need and as part of LCI's ongoing advancement, we're making a step change in the way we engage with and support the construction sector on their lean journey. Um, so let's just move on. Um, so what we're proposing to do as Lean Construction Ireland over this year and next, um, so implementing a comprehensive calendar of events and activities throughout the country, webinars, breakfast meetings, community events, with a focus on the practical application of lean thinking and lean practices, um, details of all those on the LCI website. We're looking to publish a book of lean case studies uh, for Irish lean construction case studies that's planned to be published in April. Uh, we're hosting a lean construction conference in Croke Park in November. Um, and I think there's a very exciting agenda being put together for that. Um, we're collaborating with state bodies, Enterprise Ireland, IDA, others to promote the lean agenda. Um, we are um, collaborating with lean service providers to ensure that the Irish construction sector's lean requirements are supported by practitioners. So that's an important part of it. 
details of a lot of practitioners are available on the website as well. Um, so Lean Construction Ireland is planning to engage with the house building sector. I think that's a, a, a focus. So we've, to date, I suppose, been looking and working with large FDI companies, state bodies, um, academia, and others, and uh, looking to engage with the house building sector and the major infrastructure projects to promote lean thinking and practices and demonstrate the value that lean can bring. Uh, lean Construction Ireland is also planning to, to further engage with the client organizations, both public and private, to promote lean thinking and practices and creating the opportunity to consider lean thinking and adoption early in the project initiation progress. <coughs> so the next 12 to 24 months are key for the LCI to increase the engagement with the construction sector in Ireland, continue to promote the lean agenda and achieve the vision to deliver projects faster, better, faster, together. Okay. So that's an introduction to Lean Construction Ireland. Um, the, all the contact details are there, uh, all through the website and various media um, for people that are interested. To move on then, um, I want to talk a little bit about Lean in Contracts, which is one of the initiatives that Lean Construction Ireland is working on. So um, Lean in Contracts was identified as a priority team as part of Vision 2020, which was where all the constituent members of, of LCI got together and mapped out what Lean in Ireland would look like and how we wanted to get there in various ways. We broke that up into, in, into chunks and Lean in Contracts was one. So I'm going to speak a little bit on that today. We identified as a priority team based on the, the constituent members of LCI recognizing a need for contracts to en that enable and promote a Lean approach enable greater productivity, reduce disputes, waste, time overruns. They're more collaborative, uh, less adversarial, uh, and produce better project outcomes. So that's what it's all about for all parties. So for the contractors, for the client, for the engineering houses, for everybody. So it's to get better outcomes. Um, so the sub team that we formed for that leading contracts group um, came from a cross section, so from academia, uh, members from engineering houses, from public sector, contractors and clients. Um, the team, we examined the current state of uh, lean in contracts and looked at what the desired future state would be uh, for lean in contracts. Then we did a, a gap analysis on that and identified some near term and longer term actions to get us to what we saw as the future state. So I'll walk through that a little bit with you. Briefly, so the current state that we saw in 2017 when we sat down and did this exercise as really as a brainstorming session amongst a large group of people. Uh, so lean is mentioned in some contracts, those would be primarily private sector at that point in time. It's referred to rather than being a measure of performance. Um, it's used in some pre-qualifications, primarily private sector again at that point in time. And we saw limited client knowledge of lean and how it should be adopted either in relation to prequals or in relation to contracts. And I suppose the overriding takeaway that we had there, that the clients are key, whether that client is, is private or public or whatever, the client is key in demanding lean and driving lean. So if the, if the client will demand it and drive it, the industry will sp respond, the contractors will respond, the engineering houses will respond, and they will follow. So that's what we saw as the current state in 2017, or a snapshot of it anyway. Um, this is an extract from the gap analysis we did, which was a lot more extensive, but I suppose three top teams that came out was contract <coughs> model, how to measure, and to set goals. So we set out near-term, mid-term, and longer-term goals for that, evaluating the existing contracts, um, engaging with some legal uh, people to look at, at what would be best practice and all with a view to not producing a contract for use but for looking at what's there and giving guidance and being able to point people in the direction of what is best practice, what will, what will help you on your lean journey. To measure, to look at some case studies of known collaborative projects, uh, look at lean scorecards and we've looked at a number of those and what's available out there and what's what's good and trying to to pull the best from everything there and looking as well at KPIs and what 
what, what can be done and what can be utilised to, to drive the lean agenda to get better outcomes for everybody. Setting goals then, um, you know, defining the desired outcomes, um, lo looking at contract terms that promote and enable lean. Um, so those are the, the near term uh, actions that we're working on at the moment, looking then into getting input on the contract model from a wider uh, section in due course, um, looking at the case studies that we're looking at and looking at the outcomes there to see how we measure and how they were measured and how we can benchmark them and getting, setting the goals as well to have, get our clients, get our supply chain expecting lean, getting that and then driving on into the, the, the last section of that, um, you know, we're able to point people in the, in the direction of best practice. Um, lean is used as a measure of, of performance in contracts and in, in projects, you know, and I suppose getting that leap of faith for clients to be able to set out from the initiation of a project on the lean journey, and that's, that's a big one to get that. So that was an extract from our gap analysis. What we saw is our future state that we'd like to see um, lean as, so contracts that embrace lean thinking, principles and behaviours, uh, that there's lean contracts that are proven in use in Ireland, there are lean contracts that are being used in Ireland, there's lean contracts proven in use elsewhere in the world, every jurisdiction is different, um, so get lean contracts that are become the norm are, are used and effective here in Ireland. Uh, those contracts that promote collaboration or non-adversarial, risk sharing, culture change, you know, it's, it's getting that mindset change and using contracts and leaning contracts as a measure of performance and contracts that are relevant to the client contractors and the subcontractors. So it's getting everybody all inclusive on board to have a lean mindset and go on that lean journey together. So that was what we saw as our future state that we're working towards. Um, so we're, we're a little bit into that journey and where we've gotten to so far. So we've been evaluating the various contract models in use in Ireland and internationally, um, looking at their ability to, to incorporate lean, promote collaboration, risk sharing and culture change. You know, we're looking at IFOA, RIA, FIDIC, uh, the NEC4 Alliance contract that came out last year. So looking at all those, uh, looking at the various contract types looked in public, FDI, commercial, local authority, home building. So there's lots of different contract types being used um, for various purposes and various projects. Um, discussing, discussing experience of lean and contracts with various projects in the UK and Ireland. You know, I think uh, uh, a lot of organisations in the UK have been very helpful to us. Um, they've been a bit down this lean journey and they're, they're, they're able to give us some good feedback on you know, what's effective, what's not effective. Um, I suppose we're looking, we're onboarding additional team members to the work group from the, the wider LCI and, and looking to move those uh, gap analysis actions forward and put some additional momentum into that. Um, and also then we're bringing a lean and contract stream in as one of the streams in the November con conference. So we're looking to do a lot of work on that and bringing that forward to November. So. And I think by the time November comes, this whole leading contracts um, subgroup will have progressed a lot more and I think there, there will be a lot of good stuff to talk about there. Um, so that's, I think, an overview of LCI and a snapshot of what we're doing in leaning contracts to date and where we plan to head on that. So that's it for me. Hopefully I got, got you back on schedule a little bit anyway. Thanks very much, everybody.
Now, I might have your attention again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, our next speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome back to GMIT, Ursula Jedrell. Uh, Ursula is a graduate of GMIT Architectural Technology Honours degree program. Indeed, she achieved first class uh, honours in that. Uh, she's currently working as Building Information Modelling Manager at Stuart Construction. Uh, she has also joined the Construction Industry Federation Construction 4.0 Committee, which is looking at the digitalization of the construction industry and how that can be implemented and harnessed towards a sustainable and efficient future for the industry. Uh, Ursula will now present a case study uh, of some of her recent work in building information modelling. Case study in them at uh, Dublin Airport Central, phase one by Stuart Construction. Here are some uh, samples of the models and uh, renders produced in house. Uh, I'm not sure where you have the laser. This, this one was produced by the fourth, fourth year uh, GMIT architecture technology student, uh, Tammy Mikolajczyk, which is working with us. Um, so I will skip the introduction and go to. Uh, so I would like to introduce the company, over 110 years in business, fourth generation family owned and run, a client focused company, multi award winning with innovative approach. And the services we provide is design, build and finance, project management, BIM enabled contractor, fit out, value engineering, sustainable construction. Uh, for more details you can go to the company website. And we are also looking for the BIM uh, coordinator at the moment if anyone is interested. So um, Dublin Airport Central, phase one. I selected this project because of its location. Uh, site is located next to the Terminal 2, which is on this side. And that's your multi-story car park. So project value is 45 million design and built uh, project. Um, it ex like demolition of existing annex buildings and two new office blocks and associated works at Dublin Airport. Uh, it is a BIM level two project as outlined in the contract documents. And Short Construction collaborated with external design team to produce tender submission. Um, at the uh, tender stage, this, uh, this project actually is at the construction stage at the moment. Uh, so at the tender stage, uh, we produced the BIM execution plan and um, BIM level two supporting documents uh, in house. Uh, CDE was put in place to ho host federated model and file naming convention had to be followed on all of the documents, not only model. model. Uh, detailed plan to maximize benefits uh, of BIM for FM. Uh, Kobe exports, Synchro Pro <coughs> utilized to display construction timeline simulation. And high quality visualizations created to support tender submission. Um, so uh, today I will focus on three points, which is CDE, uh, file naming convention, and then timeline simulations. Uh, so we had to put um, steps in place uh, for BIM to deliver BIM level two project, which was selecting CDE, as we noticed in the process that our um <coughs> current um, CDE wasn't able to capture a suitability codes, so we had to look elsewhere. Uh, we found viewpoints for projects to be BIM level two um, compliant. Uh, what we didn't know at the time uh, was that you don't get uh, the ready to use product. You do have to build the platform for yourself and um, build the workflows and set, um, set them correctly. So uh, I'm uh, one of the admins on uh, CDE. So I was heavily involved in uh, building the uh, CDE, assigning workflows. Uh, so right now, if we upload the models to the CDE, those would be automatically, automatically assigned to the correct workflow. So I if you see like a four different sections of CDE, uh, you have work in progress, shared, uh, published, and archive. Uh, so basing on your, let's say you want to upload um, suitable for information uh, model, which will be automatically assigned to a shared workflow. And in those workflows, you have all the checks, uh, which uh, Patrick King's King was uh, mentioning before in his presentation as well. And uh, those are requirements on the BIM level two projects. Um, 
Um, so uh, the, um, the way like um, four sections of CDE would be controlled by filters rather than uh, creating the physical containers or um, folders. Uh, next one, file naming convention. Uh, for those who are just starting their BIM journey, file naming convention is a good uh, place to start. Um, what we had to do was to introduce the file naming to all of the departments, not only BIM. And you can see on the right side here of the screen, uh, this is the A3 poster, which we have printed at each works workstation, so everyone can use the codes correctly. Then next one, um, you can see here um, different <coughs> models produ produced by different disciplines. So you're looking at the structural model, architectural, mechanical, and landscape. And those are um, shared, uh, linked together by shared coordinate system in one CM combined model, uh, which is also showing site setup, which is hoarding line, crane position, and the compound setup to the back. Okay. Uh, for the timeline simulations, as a main contractor, we would uh, build the timeline simulations at the tender stage. And the program we use uh, for that is called Synchro Pro. Uh, it's a user-friendly layout. And you can see, you can, whoop, what? Sorry. <laughs> uh, you can import the model and it's displayed here in the 3D window. And also um, ASA Power Project um, uh, program, which is displayed in the Gantt chart. Uh, so what you have to do here is assign each element from the model back to the program and give appearance is it going to be construct, demolished, or temporary works. And then when all elements are assigned, you can create the animation, which is at the bottom. You're capturing the different camera positions at a given time. And when you're happy with your animation, uh, you can export that to video editing software where uh, visualizations, logos, and music would be added. And after that, uh, we would also uh, compress those files because they can come up very um, large. Uh, so here are the visualizations produced at the tender stage, um, external and internal visualizations. And the last one I would like to play a video, if that works. No. How do you say on this? Will that work? the music. Thank you.
No. So just uh, have your attention, ladies and gentlemen, um, before we move to our uh, final speaker today, uh, we've got to announce the competition results. So we had um, two people uh, tie for first with 26 out of 30. So um, what I'll do is we've only got one prize. I'll get uh, Justin Malloy. Justin, you the test yet? Uh, you might just pick one of these. Okay, so the rules were that you had to be in the room to uh, receive the prize. So um, the winner at the moment is Pat Neary. Pat here. Sorry? Well. <laughs> what do you think? Coming back? Hey? Oh, okay. If we can get it back before the Kevin's finished, we'll um, go for that. Now, if I might have your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Um, final speaker today is Kevin Duke. Uh, Kevin is Managing Director of Duke McCaffrey Construction Consultants, based in Dublin. Uh, Kevin is a chartered quantity surveyor with over 25 years' experience, working at executive level, managing service delivery and strategic development and direction. His extensive cost and project management, procurement, due diligence and expert witness experience. This has been gained over a wide range of economic sectors on projects in Ireland, the UK and Europe, ranging in value from 100,000 up to 3 billion. Uh, today, Kevin is going to take a, a wide ranging look at some of the key factors affecting the surveying profession today. Uh, I won't keep you long. Um, thanks for staying to listen to me. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Martin for inviting me along. And secondly, I'd just like to thank the rest of the speakers for the quality and content of the presentations. I hope I don't drag the standard down. Um, just a, as a bit of background, um, I, I'm a, I was also a member of the QS Committee for the Society of Charter Surveyors, and I was also uh, the SCSI representative on the Liaison Committee. So I suppose I have a bit of knowledge about some of these this stuff that I'm going to go through. It's, it's a very broad range of subjects. It's going to keep it just high, very, very high level. Um, and I suppose just indulge me for a few moments while I just kind of give you a very brief introduction to Duke McCaffrey. Um, I suppose we're, we're established in late 2015. Um, we're an independent range of uh, construction consultants where we, uh, we're independent of, of design. We offer a range of flexible services to our clients so that we can flex to suit their particular requirements and we're focused really on delivering an excellent service to our clients. Um, just in terms of our services, um, we've got three streams, cost management, uh, project management and consulting. Cost management is, is uh, quantity surveying by, by another term. Um, but I suppose we are probably see ourselves as having a bit of a unique USP in terms of we actually do M&E cost management as well. So we firmly believe that you, a QS, as a QS, you should be looking after 100% of the cost of the project, not just 60, 70% of it. So we have a, a specialist expertise in, in M&E co cost management. In terms of project management, that encompasses obviously the project management sphere itself, but also includes employer's agent and employer's rep. Uh, and then the consulting uh, is really just everything else outside of that. So that would include um, due diligence, it would include expert witness, it would include claims assessment and dispute resolution. 
just very briefly, uh, just some of our experience. Um, I suppose we're, we're lucky enough in terms of we, sorry, uh, we've, we're fairly uh, busy in the, in the hot sectors at the moment. So things like student accommodation, residential, fit out, hotels, hospitality, retail. I suppose data centers is an unusual one to have on a, on a, on a, a list of experience. But again, that's because of our M&E experience. So I suppose it's another uh, string to our bow. Just some of our clients, I'm not going to dwell on that, get into the, to the meaty bit of this uh, presentation. Um, so the first thing I'm going to really talk about is the RAI form of contract. Um, so there was a new form of contract brought out on August 2017. So you have your blue form for without quants and you have your yellow form for with quants. Why is this important? This is really the base contractual document for any traditionally procured uh, private sector job in Ireland. So it's an important, very important document. It's the first update since 2012. So again, it's, it's, it's something that, I suppose, came out under the radar to some extent. So it's, it's, it's an important document to, to talk about. Um, like I say, I've already said it's the yellow form and the blue form. I mean, what I really wanted to, uh, was trying to do was to actually incorporate the requirements of the Construction Contracts Act, which I'll go into in a bit more detail later. But when they were doing that, they actually took the opportunity to do well, they actually planned seven edits, but they've actually only incorporated five of them at the moment. Um, we'll go, I'll go into them in, in detail um, in a couple of seconds, but I suppose edit four, which is related to VAT, that was postponed, was there, I think we're still having discussions with the revenue commissioners over how VAT should be dealt with. Um, and edit seven was just re the retention bond wording is still being discussed with the bondsmen and insurers in, in the industry at the moment. So uh, edit one was just the identity parties. Essentially, what they've just given you the opportunity to insert the CRO number, because obviously there was a lot of sp development specific construction companies and, and development partner partners were, were established. So you're just tying down exactly who you're actually contracting with. Definition of the works. This is actually a total uh, clause of D and E on the, on in clause or sub clause of D and E in clause one are actually totally new to the contract. So clause D, describes the works. It's never been described before, um, but it actually gets into a lot of detail in terms of it talks about building control, it talks about building regulations, and it also it references the Code of Practice for, certifying, for Inspecting and Certifying Buildings <coughs> and Works 2016. And it also actually refers to uh, practical completion not being achieved until um, employer staff are trained in the safe use and maintenance of, of, of the particularly M&E equipment and M&E installations. So it's again, it's, it's, it's unusual in terms of it's a, a specific reference to the works and it's surprising that it hasn't been described before in, in, in that level of detail. Um, Subclause E is, is really just talking about uh, the Organisation of Time Working Act, um, which is really just referring to what are our working days and it's related to not notifications and notices under the contract. Um, editing and uh, or avoiding and resol resolving disputes and um, this was previously just dispute resolution so what they've tried to change the emphasis in terms of they're trying to make it a bit more uh, kind of move away from actually having disputes so you, they're trying to encourage negotiation so they're supporting the culture of negotiation and um, conciliation is still retained as the primary method of resolution and um, it does refer to the RAA guidelines and procedures it does also specifically ref reference adjudication and again we'll come to that when we talk about the Construction Contracts Act. And then again, it's, it's sim the whole wording has just been simplified and made much more user-friendly, much more modern in its, in its look as well. Um, so again, arbitration refers to the Arbitration Act 2010 and, and other relevant legislation. Edit 5 is really the Construction Contracts Act. It brings in, talks about the um, notifications, so the new Article 5, so how you deliver them. And then in the appendix to the contract, it then gives you the the opportunity to insert an actual um, email address. So again, it's, 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 it's updating it, bringing it more into the modern life and modern way of doing work. Um, yeah. So just the main changes. Article agreement, new fifth article, definitions have been amended. Uh, clause 35, we'll come to in, uh, in later on in, in terms of the Construction Contracts Act. Um, clause 38, dispute resolution, uh, again, has been redrafted. Um, the just the text has been generally updated. It's now gender neutral, there's no he's and she's, it's, it's just now gender, gender neutral. Um, the appendix to the, has, has been changed and then 
But again, we've come to the Construction Contract Act previously, um, the references in the contract to were to weeks for certificates and payments, whereas they now refer to as months. So again, it's aligning with the Construction Contract Act. Uh, the next issue I want to talk about is the sectoral employment order, um, which was uh, brought in in October. Uh, it replaces the registered employment agreement, uh, which going back some years was um, declared un unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 2013. Um, and I suppose the, the main reason for that was because essentially the Labour Court were setting um, pay rates and they were seen as to be an unelected body and it was seen to be unconstitutional. Um, the, I suppose one of the big issues with this is the sectoral employment order is actually still being, the rates are still being set by the Labour Court. So there's a bit of confusion over the relevance and the constitutionality of this, but I suppose it's in existence at the moment. Nobody's challenged it. Nobody has the deep pockets at the moment, I suppose, to challenge it at the moment. So um, what it really does, it sets out basic hourly rates of pay on social hours payment. Can, it sets, essentially imposes an obligation on, on construction uh, firms now to have a pension scheme, a sick pay scheme, and a dispute resolution procedure for all of their employees. So it deals with both pay, pension, sick pay, and death and service. I suppose so the, the employers are legally uh, obliged to implement these recommendations. Um, again, the employees, it's up to them. The, the employer has to ensure that the employees are registered with the Construction Workers Pension Scheme. And uh, contributions have to be paid by the employees as well as the employers. Um, and then I suppose in terms of tendering processes, there's now going to be in the public procurement realm there's now going to be an onus on construction companies to prove that they are, uh, they do have these um, systems and, and, and policies in, pla in place, and particularly in terms of pensions and, <coughs> and sick pay schemes. So you're going to have the, for example, the, let the CWPS will have to provide a letter of compliance, which is going to have to be put in, in bids and, and tender documents and things along the lines. So just, I suppose generally, these are the new rates. I don't propose to go through them, but generally it's something between 8 and 10% of an increase on the previous rates. So what they're doing is they're catching up on cuts that were made back in <coughs> 2012, 2013, and they're now catching up in terms of these are the new rates. Um, the other thing is also now it's very specific in terms of the payments that have to be made to staff for unsocial hours. So. Uh, if you're working from normal finish time to midnight, you get time and a half, normal to, or midnight to normal is twice, etc. So that again, it's all set out there. It's all, a, a lot of this was probably in place in any case, but it's just, it's very specific now. It actually defined it because with the abolition of the registered employment agreement, that sort of information was no longer uh, in a recognizable form. Again, it imposes a requirement to provide a pension scheme. So it's an occupational pension scheme. It has to be registered and regulated by the pension authority. Um, it, it can be, it's going to be a multi-employer scheme. So it's not going to be a specific in pension scheme for job logs, construction, or so it's going to be a, an industry-wide scheme. Because I suppose, again, what that's trying to recognize is that there's mobility. People move from job to job and from firm to firm. So again, it's, it's, it's spreading the, the pension scheme so that it's relevant to everyone because sometimes when people move jobs they didn't bother taking up the pension scheme or there was a new uh, period qualification that they had to do a minimum two years ex uh, uh, work with them. So it's all trying to cut out all of that sort of stuff. Um, so again, it's age between six 20 and 65. Those are the minimum contributions, retirement age, and then obviously death and service. So if you die, you get a multiple of your, your last uh, annual salary. Uh, again, the sick pay scheme is now mandatory. Um, so it's going to be held in trust and it has to be independently managed and administered. So again, it's, it's, it's been very specific in terms of what, what the requirements are. The contributions, as you can see, are defined there as well. The one thing that they do say is that you have to get a minimum, you have to be entitled to a minimum of 10 weeks under the scheme. So you can't, they can't just stop you at, at the, at the, at the, after six weeks, six in terms of sick pay. So why is this of interest? Um, I suppose it's, it's, it comes down to cost. You know, if you're already in a contract and you've signed this based on a particular terms and conditions, and this is a change of um, this is a change in terms of employment conditions and pay that you have to pay, pay people, um, can you actually recoup it? I suppose it really comes down to in uh, REA contracts, clause 36. Generally, if that's struck out, then 
you're not entitled to any labour or wage or material incre price increases. But if, if clause four is, is retained, you probably can look for some sort of a recoupment of the cost because it's a new legislative enactment. Um, again, bespoke contracts, that will obviously depend on what way the, the legal eagles have drafted them. The public works contracts are a bit more complicated in terms of um, if, you haven't, if you haven't signed your letter of acceptance, then you, uh, you will get them, get, you will go just go back to the employer and get them to change the, the terms of, of the contract and get the, the, the cost increase in, included. Um, there are PV1 and PV2 provisions in the contract, which is price variation 1 and price <coughs> variation 2. I suppose the, the big issue there is that um, the references in and the terminology used in those clauses don't align with the current working environment in terms of the legislation. It refers to the registered employment agreement, which doesn't exist. It also employer, it ref it refers to the social partnership agreements, which again don't exist. So there's, there's confusion over whether, whether you can actually recoup the cost under the public work contract. The Government Contracts Central, Central Contracts Committee, GCCC, they think you can't. But somebody, nobody's challenged it at the moment. Um, but I think the biggest issue is that, um, obviously, if you haven't submitted a notice of claim under Clause 10.3 within 20, wor 20 working days of the 19th of October, you're probably going to be time barred. So we've just talked very quickly about the Construction Contracts Act. Um, so re really what it was trying to do was just improve the cash flow situation, particularly in, t in terms of payments to subcontractors. So it, it introduced uh, the statutory dispute resolution mechanism, which was adjudication. Uh, and it also what is trying to, I suppose, speed up the whole process in terms of payments and, and dispute and, and sorting out disputes as well. It uh, came into effect in July 2016. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail. Essentially, it gets rid of pay when paid, which was, pr was uh, very extensive. That clause was very extensive in a, in, across all contracts in the industry. Um, it also gives you the subcontractor an entitlement to suspend, and the contractor, sorry, an entitlement to suspend work if you don't get paid uh, without having, without it being, uh, being seen to be determining the contract. Um, so it doesn't apply to those particular uh, types of contracts, so domestic dwellings, etc. I'm not going to go into that. I suppose the big thing is the parties cannot contract out of it. It's a statutory requirement, so you can't have a, a contract between a subcontractor and a contractor and a client and a contractor and a, and a contractor that doesn't recognize the existence of the, con the Construction Contracts Act. There is a discrepancy between the time limitations in the main contract terms and the requirements in terms of binding, sub binding subcontractors, uh, subcontract time limitations, which we'll go into now in a second. But there is actually in existence the, the Quantity Surveyor's Guide to the Construction Contract Act, which is, is quite good in terms of, it gives flow charts in terms of the process and how it should be, how it all should happen. So these are the payment dates, uh, or the, the maximum dates that are uh, in the Construction Contracts Act. It generally operates in a 30-day 30 30, 30 payment cycle. Um, it's interesting that the RAI contract actually refers to a five-day period for issuing a uh, architect certificate and a seven-day period for actually paying the contractor. So there's a discrepancy between the Construction Contracts Act and the RIA, even though they've went to all the trouble of amending it. Um, but I suppose these are the maximum dates, and I suppose you can always amend the dates in the, in the, in the RIA. Um, they look the same. <laughs> the problem is that the main contract subcontract timing actually starts on the first day that the subcontractor starts on site, which may not be, and it definitely won't be, aligned with the main contractor employer timings. So if you can imagine on a job where you've got 20, you could have 20 subcontractors all operating on different payment cycles, and then that has to feed into the main contractor's timings as well. So it's, it's really just creating a cash flow issue for, for contractors really to see what they can do. Um, and obviously, at present, it's still, it hasn't, there's, I think there's only about two or three disputes actually going through the, ar the adjudication process. So it, it seems to have not created as many waves as everybody was anticipating. Maybe it's because contractors are deeper pockets than everybody else, I don't know. That's just the flow chart, just an extract from the, the, the um, FCSI guide. Um, the right hand side, that's life, it's perfect. When you start moving across the page to the right hand, to the left hand side, that's where you start getting into issues and non-payment and adjudication and all that. But again, I'd refer you to the, uh, to the uh, SCSI 
about the issues that matter. I suppose one of the big things that um, Construction Contracts Act well, actually came into existence in 2012. Um, it's obviously the Construction Contract Act 20, 2013. Um, so why did it take three years for it to be implemented? It really was to enable um, adjudication to be validated and uh, become a legislative um, requirement in, in under construction, in Irish construction law. Um, and also then, it, uh, following that, then the various bodies, or uh, SDF, then had to set up adjudication panels because there had to be adjudication panels in existence before they could implement the law. Um, so it broadly follows the, the UK process and the UK model. Um, the adjudication is obviously optional. You can refer to it at, uh, at any time. Um, the decision is binding in the interim, so whatever it is, and then you, and you have to make a payment, and then you can, you can actually then appeal it to, and, and, and appeal it to adjudication, and then it goes to arbitration if you want, and then obviously litigation ultimately. But, um, obviously, the one of the advantages is it can be running simultaneously with a conciliation. Um, and also multiple disputes can be, can, be, can be dealt with by the same adjudicator. So you can agree one adjudicator for one panel and then he deals with them all as they as they're arise. Um, the adjudication itself, um, you have to give the adjudicator the information, uh, enough information to enable him to within seven days of his appointment. He then has to make a decision within 28 days. He can get a 14 day extension, but that's only in ex exceptional circumstances. It's, it's, it's a bit of an informal process, but there can be a hearing in terms of both parties, but both parties have to be in attendance. And then the decision in writing, um, signed, dated, and the reason for the decision, obviously, unless the uh, parties agree that he doesn't have to give a reason for the decision. Just some smiley faces, just showing the various um, adjudication, or, or sorry, dispute resolution uh, methodologies available. Um, I'm not proposing to go through them, but you can see that there's some of them are more expensive, some of them favor particular parties, etc. So again, it's just, it's just a, a, a nice document to, to just be able to refer to. Um, so what are the implications? Uh, I suppose main contractors pre previously had been relying on the subcontractors overdraft because they were paying them when the, whenever they got paid. Um, so that created issues in terms of um, payment, uh, whereas, whereas now what's happening is main contractors are now gonna have to have a larger capital basis, gonna have better, better cash flow. Um, and I suppose the final thing there is the final payment to the subcontractor has to be 30 days after final completion, whereas he could still be in negotiations um, with, the, with, the, with the employer in terms of what the final account is. So again, it's, it's, it's a cash flow issue. So technically you should increase vendor, should increase vendor prices. For, a sub, for subcontractors, it obviously gets rid of pay when paid. Um, there's a culture change in terms of the subbies are now much more, or sorry, the main contractors are now much more dependent on the subbies. Um, and there's obviously certainty, certainty in payment cycle um, and the dispute resolution procedure is outside of the court. So again, it's quicker uh, and cheaper. So I suppose, excuse me, what it should really resu result in is a stronger supply chain relationship. Okay. Construction costs, tender prices. Um, I suppose we've dealt with, the Tomas has dealt with this to some extent, but that's the latest SDSI indices uh, that came out in February. Um, which are showing an upward trend, uh, and it's, it's anticipated that the trend will continue, 6 to 7% per, per annum going forward. This is an interesting graph in terms of, it actually tracks construction input. Um, so, what, so what you can see is that construction input hasn't really changed all that much, where its attended prices have fallen off the cliff edge in 2007 to 2010, and are now starting to come back up. So really, in a, it's what has exacerbated the, construction is a low, a low margin industry anyhow, you know, main contractors would generally be making a, a below 5% net margin. Um, so what's happened is obviously that contractors have been swallowing to some extent the construction costs or they've been managing to mitigate it. Um, but now tender prices are starting to, to catch up. So maybe contractors might start making a bit more money. Uh, I suppose generally, what's the, what's the industry out there? Um, it's ha there are some maj major issues because we lot lost a lot of um, supply chain members and we also lost a lot of people during the, during the recession. So things like steelwork are difficult to resource. There is a limited capacity in Ireland for steelwork, so people are having to go to the UK to talk to contractors and to sub and suppliers and get stuff in. Again, similarly with facade suppliers, 
A lot of them went to the UK. They're very busy over there. They're not interested in working in Ireland, or they are. If they are, then it's at a particular premium. Um, joinery, the number of joinery workshops that closed during the recession is astronomical. So again, there's issues with, with getting hold of joiners. Plastering, partitions, block work, brick work. I mean, uh, in Dublin, we're now being quoted rates of one euro 10 for laying a block and one euro 50 for laying a brick. So, you know, you're back to the, the boom time rates. Um, there's still an issue with terms of the skilled base, uh, and particularly uh, in the professions and also in the construction, in the contractors side as well. Um, <coughs> so from students' point of view coming out and qualifying in a few, in the next, over the next few years, that should be a good, a good, good news. Um, there's still issues with plant and equipment, again, getting hold of a crane. Um, bad old days, all, everybody sold off their plant and equipment, sold off their cranes, whereas now people are having to go over to Germany to buy them. And straight from the lever or whoever in the manufacturers. Um, site huts and welfare facilities, again, getting hold of them is, is an issue. Um, scaffolding, again, uh, it's getting to the stage now where some um, contractors are actually buying scaffolding companies so they can actually have security of scaffolding. Um, and obviously some of this is going to lead to industrial relations issues, and that's without even thinking about the Brexit and foreign exchange implications, but <coughs> obviously Sterling is hugely substantial. Some procur procurement issues, there's obviously organizational failures happening. You know, uh, it's historically most prevalent when the market has turned. Um, you know, we've seen Manly, we've seen Moriarty's, Carillion in the UK, lagging construction last week in, 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 in Northern Ireland. So there are people, you know, despite the boom and what everybody sees as the boom, there are still contractors who have obviously taken on bad jobs or are losing money and they're obviously, or they've got, um, <coughs> issues from the past that have caught up with them, so they're still obviously uh, failing. Um, cash on credit lines, again, with the, as I spoke about with the, with the Construction Contracts Act and the payment terms there, that there's issues in terms of cash flow and, and securing credit lines. Um, we've already spoken about the certainty of supply with contractors or with subcontractors because you can actually tender for a job using a discrete set of, of subcontractors, but actually when you go to, if you secure the job and then you go to actually bring them on site to say, ah, yeah, but that was actually 10% higher now, you know, so you've got issues like that, and that's particularly with the subcontract rates. Um, I've already spoken about the, the, uh, the payment terms and subcontract terms. What we're finding is that partnering and frameworks and negotiation now is becoming much, much more prevalent, two-stage tenders as well. Um, so I suppose there's, there, there are issues in the industry. Construction insolvency, very quickly. What does construction sol insolvency result in? I suppose it results in uh, increased costs, project delays, and third parties losing the benefit of collateral warranties. There's <coughs> numerous occasions where collateral warranties haven't been signed, and then you know, parties don't have to step <coughs> in right to finish off jobs, etc., like that. So there's, there's all sorts of issues <coughs> like that. Some of the practical steps, you know, you closely monitor the contractor's performance. If he starts falling behind in cash flow, then you go, you know, what's going on here? Um, but you obviously, you don't want to overreact. Um, obviously, things like performance bonds and parent company guarantees, make sure they're in place. Um, warranties are being provided, et cetera. All insurances are in place. Uh, and obviously, make sure once, if the renewal date has passed, make sure that the new ones have been put, been put in place as well. Um, obviously, know the contract as well in terms of what the, what, the, what, what, the, what the issues are and what the possibilities are. Some of the warning signs, inflated applications, inflated variation claims. Um, unfounded or optimistic delay, disruption, loss and expense claims, just throwing money at variations. Um, falling behind cash flow, not recovering. Um, claims for material deposits and off-site materials if they're ex exaggerated or they're over-optimistic. Uh, change in subcontractors, change in suppliers, slow down activity and don't reco recover the, the slow down as well. And we, I mean, changes in site management, man site management, etc. If you see a high turnover in personnel, you should start wondering what's going on. Finally, uh, we've spoken a lot about <coughs> housing and the issues in the housing market. Um, but I just wanted to very quickly just talk about residential construction costs. Um, the SCSI have done some, some quite good wor work in terms of the two, two reports they've published. Uh, May, May 2016 was in terms of the house costs, uh, and October of 2017 was in terms of apartment costs. Um, I suppose what, what they both confirmed is that construction costs really isn't the, the largest proportion of the, of the cost of developing. Um, if, we go, if we look here, as you can see, the actual construction cost is the top line, so house is 37% of the cost. 
balance is made up of site work, site development, fees, etc. And you can see there's a large proportion for things like margins, VAT, etc. And obviously, you know, it's going to with land as well. Um, so these are, I suppose, are, are I suppose, it's taking that across a, a, a broad spectrum of, of particular projects. Um, and similarly with apartments, whilst the apartments are a bit more expensive to construct, the, you know, the, the ratio is still not substantially different. Again, this is an extract from the SCSI method. And if you read that, sorry, I suppose what it's, sho it's showing is that uh, the reality is that a lot of the apartment developments are just not viable. Just ca you, it costs you more to build them than you what you can actually sell them for. So the, the orange is essentially the unviable development. So of that group of six, five of them are unviable. And so just trying to show here, I guess, again, this is not our camera, but I guess it's very important, that there is a, a, a serious issue in terms of if you take the, the grey dotted line is essentially the couple's budget. So if you take a, an average couple's budget, uh, assume that you're going to have to pay 10% deposit on any property, and obviously use the maximum loan to value rate of 3.5, the combined income, um, the grey line is essentially what you can afford, or what you can actually get a loan for. And you can see blue dot is the actual couple of dots. It's, it's essentially what it costs you to build them, and the orange dot is essentially what you can sell them for. So the problem is it, it costs you more to build them than it does actually to make them viable. So I think this is just uh, highlighting that there is a, a fundamental issue here in the, in, in the marketplace at the moment. You know, it's not a case of salaries going up, it's a case of the on cost and construction being looked at and something being done to reduce them because construction cost is not the, is not the big issue here. Thank you. No pop. So have we Pat Neary back? Come up, Pat, now. So, Pat's the winner of our um, competition. Um, so, we've, uh, uh, again, a little apology to make. Because GMIT was shut last week for two days, uh, the prize came by a courier on the Thursday and was taken back. I was promised it this afternoon, uh, but it hasn't shown up. So, I'm going to present uh, Pat with this jiffy bag of GMIT prospectus. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, uh, I promise in front of witnesses that as soon as I get the iPad, uh, it'll come on to you. So we might get, say, uh, Kevin Murphy. Uh, yeah, so um, just one announcement. Uh, this, those of you that wanted CPD uh, certificates are available um, when we finish just outside the door here. Uh, I'll now just ask um, Jared McNichol, school, uh, Head of School of Engineering, just to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I won't keep you long. I really just want to offer a vote of thanks to people who have uh, participated in this conference. But given that I'm here, let me talk a little bit. 
the ecology of this conference is most important. It's not just a conference, it's not just a forum for people to actually come and trade and exchange their ideas, their experiences, which is the primary aim of the conference. But there are a lot, are a lot of other purposes for all the st other stakeholders involved. Uh, we've heard today, for example, of uh, issues associated with planning, flooding, digitalization in BIM, new technologies, uh, the public contracts, uh, and the old perennial of this conference is where is the industry, where are we, uh, what's the situation uh, with respect, have we bottomed out yet, or are we growing, are we there yet? So it's very reassuring year after year to hear that the industry is prospering uh, and uh, shaping up as a completely different sector uh, prior to the collapse of the economy. Uh, it's also an opportunity and a forum for people in the informal space associated with the conference to, again, trade ideas and exchange experiences, uh, to benchmark where they are, uh, who's doing what, what's happening. Uh, and that's vital, that informal uh, tacit knowledge of the sector is absolutely vital. Just as it is, if you're a student, you want to know, how do I pass that subject? Do I have to attend all the classes? And so on. That's the analog of that public space, that forum for meeting and exchanging uh, opinions and ideas. Then there's also the speakers themselves and what they have to say, uh, the practitioners, the professionals. Um, in a very formal way, this is important in GMIT because this allows us to say that we have engaged with the sector. Uh, but we've done more than that. We've created a, a West of Ireland Constructure calendar uh, event that is uh, now most definitely on the calendar because people expect it and we're happy to continue to provide uh, this, this forum. I learned yesterday that it's actually always on a Tuesday, just like Shrove Tuesday is. Uh, so that is something for your, for your calendar. Uh, and then, as you can see, if you look around you, there are lots of students. They've rapidly disappeared, of course. But for them, it's a learning experience as well. And, and we have learned uh, how to use opportunities like this to incorporate into the curriculum and become a learning experience for them. They're also here, of course, to hear about the, the trends and developments in the sector, to listen to the practitioners and the experts. Uh, and for them, that's a vindication of the quality of their own course, because they in turn expect that to be reflected in the curriculum and to hear the same sorts of things from their lectures. So it's very important to lectures also to be here, uh, because they meet you, the the sector, the people, uh, rather an economic activity that actually constitute all reality and the human experience. So to meet you is most important uh, and to actually hear about what's happening in the industry. Uh, and a lot of what they hear is incorporated into the development of their curriculum or into their teaching or becomes a case study or whatever. And that's so important. They also have more authority with respect to their, their students um, because the, their students understand that they're fully engaged with the sector. And there's another dimension, of course, that we've pioneered in the building and civil engineering department, and that relates to research in the, the sector. We have quite a large number of people presently doing PhDs, and we have a number with PhDs who have pioneered research in the built environment in the west of Ireland, outside of the civil engineering space. In construction, uh, lean, lean technologies, waste, recyclable, recyclables, uh, policies, methodologies, and so on. And coming to such a conference inspires and gives them uh, more opportunity to, to do more research and to also hear that some of the things that they worked on a few years ago uh, are now standard practice. So that's very important for our lecturers. Uh, and just continuing the theme of the ecology, our graduates are important people as well because they constitute those people in the sector. Uh, and we're proud and happy that we've got high quality programs producing graduates that are very much sought after 
uh, in the sector. Our graduates over the last few years have become speakers at this conference. And yet again, this year we had two. Uh, I'll actually mention them specifically. We had Ursula Dreddall and Oliver Madden, respectively from Stewart's and CRH. So in a sense, we've come of age as a department uh, of the built environment in building and civil engineering with our programs, which are fully aligned to the professional and the uh, professional body requirements in the sector. And that our own graduates are also up here addressing us about uh, developments and innovations in the construction sector. So I think we've come of age. I hope you agree with me on that in that respect uh, and that you'll continue to come most certainly next year as well. It just remains then for me to thank you for coming. Uh, you were the first stakeholder I mentioned, uh, the audience, uh, and I hope that you found the experience useful in terms of those ideas, ex innovations and experiences. I want to thank our students for their patience and actually sustaining themselves for most of the day here. Uh, that that is important, that ability to persist. And I want to, to thank uh, the organizers of the conference, um, particularly Martin Taggart, who, whose idea this conference was in, in terms of innovation. And he has kept it going through lean times, not just externally, but internally here in GMIT, and uh, his colleagues who have supported him um, all the way through this. And Mary Rogers, the head of the department, who has ensured that all the bureaucratic impediments available to us in GMIT are present, or at least she minimized them. Uh, and then our exhibitors and our sponsors, they're also very much part of the ecology of this conference. I want to th thank all of those people. They have presented stands and contribute to, to the uh, financially to the viability of the conference. Uh, we've had stands on new technologies. Uh, this year, recruitment was a feature, uh, which is a vindication of what some people at the conference were saying here today about skill shortages, uh, and that they thought it was worthwhile coming here uh, and getting value for the day that it cost them to come here in terms of recruitment. So I'd like to thank our sponsors and exhibitors as, as well. So it just remains for me to say safe home on those motorways that you have helped to, to contribute uh, to design, the design of and the construction of. Uh, thank you very much then.